you day. Uh, Anthony, uh, appreciate you joining us. It, just what's your early feel for this finals right now? Who, who are you leaning towards? Oh, is that, is, is that, is that, um, is that you guys hear me? Yeah, we, yeah. we got, we got I you. I want Warriors in seven, but it's not one of those picks I'm like really, you know, feeling strongly about. I think anytime you pick seven, you're like, eh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I do think the experience factor matters. I'm just down at media day to day, and you could tell Warriors, it's like, especially the main Warriors guys, it's like, all right, we know we got to do this station. We're going to have to deal with Guillermo from the Jimmy Kimmel show. It's like, you know, all these different media members, whereas, Celtics, I think, you know, they're walking in like, wait, what? Everything is open. There's suddenly like, you know, 20 times the amount of media members. They had three more days. The Warriors had three extra days of rest, didn't have to fly. Mm -hmm. I think they need to jump the Celtics early. And, I, you know, 1-1, I'd be feeling kind of sketchy if I'm the Warriors going back to Boston. 2-0, I, I think like that will define the, the early part of the series to me defines where I think it's going. And I look at this this series between these two, and I feel I feel like Boston matches up well. There are some matchups that Golden State has that um, I, I think they can work out mo mostly with their depth. I mean, they they can go nine in some 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 cases ten guys deep. So I think that's going to be big, especially after this long playoff season and Boston going seven twice and, and having these knockdown dragouts, but. Boston, where do you see their matchups being in favor of them? What are, what are some of the things that maybe they can exploit and give problems with Golden State with in the series? I think they're really well built to defend the Warriors. I mean, they're the best defensive basketball this season regardless. But also, you know, even bending back, you know, to the dynasty days of the Warriors, they've always played the Warriors kind of well. Marcus Smart is your prototype guy. You kind of want Jason Curry around, right, because he mm. he's like – kind of low to the ground gets around screens really well he almost reminds me of a wrestler the way he can hmm. kind of just you know defend and he's always to pushing people around and stuff so i just think that's a pretty good point of attack for curry about as good as you can have in the league uh two long wings uh, you know tatum and uh brown that can you know hold their own and then to me you always want a good rim protector against the warriors it's what jaron jackson did in the second round which i think made life tough to get 15 blocks in that series. It's what Dallas didn't have in the conference finals. They were not scared right. to go to the rim because Maxi Kleva was like their best shot blocker, I guess. Uh, you know, that's why Jordan Poole was getting to the rim a bunch. Steph was. Their points in the paint were crazy. Robert Williams should be, you know, a healthy Robert Williams is a huge factor in this series. When, when the Boston blew the Warriors out in March, he had four blocks. He was altering everything. Problem is Robert Williams then tore his meniscus. He's kind of rushed back. He's questionable basically every game. You saw late in the Miami series, he could barely play. Um, they're calling him, you know, questionable for game one. They said he's just going to continue to be day to day. So, you know, I'd, I'd want to know his health status and even Marcus Smarts too, right? That was a really bad ankle sprain he had. Yeah. Um, so if he's not himself laterally, it's tougher to guard Curry. But theoretically, without knowing all the health and body situations, Boston's really well built to defend the Warriors. Rob Williams was a guy I wanted to talk about, but you definitely you brought up another name that uh, you can't help but talk about when you talk about this Golden State Warriors team this year, and that's Jordan Poole. How much has his explosion changed what the Warriors can do offensively? A ton. You know, I think one of the big problems the last couple of years post Durant was uh, the lack of ball uh handlers and shot creators next to Steph Curry it allowed defenses so much to just load up it really started with Nick Nurse in the 2019 finals after Durant goes out after Clay's out um and they just you know it was boxing ones and blitzing and suddenly the emergence of Jordan Poole Steph Curry's getting double I can really remember a game midseason in Denver where he just kept tossing it over mm -hmm. to Jordan Poole and it was like cool four on three creation downhill and Jordan Poole's like turning it you know he is a 22 point per game i think type talent in this league already um and that's mattered a bunch in the playoffs but one of the things you have seen as these playoffs have gone on is teams starting to pick at jordan Poole's weakness defensively because that's what the playoffs are about the deeper you go you know especially in the modern nba it's like find a weakness keep going at it dallas did it a lot kind of made kerr have to pull pool off the floor more than they wanted i don't think boston targets as well as like a luka Doncic dallas team does but, you know, look, if if he's not being physical defensively, if Jason Tatum keeps getting him on switches in this series, it's going to be – Steve Kerr tries to – you know, I know he was when he was a player, he was an offensive player, but he really is a defensive coach. 
and I'm just curious in this series how how willing he'll be to live with Poole's defensive uh, shortcomings because they do need him offensively because, as you said, his arrival has just kind of jolted what they can do offensively. Yeah. Pulling back a little bit with the big picture here is where Anthony Slater, the athletic here, uh, kind enough to join us uh, on D'Lo and KC talking about these NBA finals. The Warriors, I thought when Kevin Durant snapped his Achilles, when they lost Klay Thompson to the ACL and they lost that NBA finals to Toronto, I thought, well, there goes the window. The window's done. They'll be a good playoff team. They'll be around. They're not going to fall off the face of the earth. But when you talk about championship, that door is slammed shut. And here we are three years later. Not only are they back in the NBA finals, but it looks like they they went to another room and opened another window because they may have another yeah. opportunity to be around as a championship level team for the next three, four, five years. Anthony, th- who saw this coming? I, I, I don't know if anybody saw this coming. No. Yeah. The question is kind of how. And honestly, we could probably sit here for an hour. To, to, there's so many layers to how. Uh, I think the most important one is Steph Curry. He just elongated his prime. You know, he's 34 years old, but his conditioning, uh, his defense, his strength, uh, his ability to get to the rim, uh, you know, they believe he's having his best defensive season ever. This is year 13. Mm. And I just think the way he takes care of his body, and you compare that to other stars in the league, right? What is the story at times this year? Luka Doncic kind of out of shape. James Harden, you know, kind of out of shape, wearing down as the playoffs go on. The Zion Williamson situation, that is, that's never an issue with Steph. He shows up at camp in, like, you know, midseason peak shape, even if he gets injured, like he sprained his foot. Uh, and Marcus Smart sprained his foot in, in March. He came back and just, like, he can play 40 minutes. The way he runs around the court, he just wears defenses down. And to me, just the way he's elongated his prime, you have to have – to be a title team in this league, you have to have a top-10 player, right? Mm-hmm. He still is one. So, that like, that is – like a non-negotiable. That's why they're still in this title window. Then beyond that, Draymond Green, you know, he's still top defensive player, uh, you know, of, of the year conversation. Clay Thompson has come back healthy enough. He's not the old Clay Thompson, but he's still, you know, you saw it in the closeout of the Mavericks. You know, he can still randomly go for 32. You kind of need that, that uh, I guess, side piece. Uh, and then the emergence of Jordan Poole, which we talked about. And then as far as the t- – them opening another title window, you got to credit the front office and the way that they have stuck to this uh, win now, develop now plan. And they, they hired the Kenny Atkinsons of the world and they really are relaying the roster under them with youth, which is risky. The stars didn't really like it, to be honest, mm-hmm. but they said, no, we're using these picks on Wiseman, Kaminga, Moody, keeping pool around developing them. And, and it does kind of feel like they're developing a second wave to try to t- take the baton slowly over the next few years. And maybe, you know, they're going to be one of the favorites going into next season, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally a first of its kind. We're going to win now and develop now. We're going to do them both. <laughs> just, light, just years. Do. Light, light years. Light years. Damn year. light years. Good. <laughs> I know. it's A lot of people question it. I question it. Draymond Green questioned it and has admitted to how much he questioned it because of, as you said, like history says you can't really do this. Um, I think it's this season is mostly a credit to the established core because they're not winning with the teenagers. But the fact that they're allowed to do this and like, you know, Kaminga looks like he's really going to be a player. We'll see with Wiseman. Um, it's it's very Spurs like, I'd say maybe that's like an, mm-hmm. the way they did this with Kawhi a little bit. Yeah. When your boss is at the athletic pulled you into the office and said, <laughs> Anthony. You're doing a great job covering the Golden State Warriors, and you've got this embarrassment of riches over the years. We're going to have you cover the Sacramento Kings, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm curious. Did you, did you ask if you were being punished? Like, what was your reaction when the athletic told you we're going to need you to cover the Kings? I like different styles of like stages of, of NBA teams and oh you love it here honestly, buddy <laughs> it wasn't an ask it was a volunteer I must admit I was like you know I'm, I, I now kind of live in the Sacramento area I make the drive down to, to SF uh, I like going to Kings games I I was thinking they I, I remember coming on with you guys early in the season they'd like just beat Portland remember in the opener and it was like you know this could be it this could be the year they break this drought um, it wasn't yeah about 10 days later, somebody threw up on the court and they fired yeah. 
and I was like, uh, you know, I, I, I might not go to as many games as I, <laughs> as I thought this year. Uh, but, hey, Mike Brown, I know Mike well. Obviously, I've covered him the last six years. I'd like to hire. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not ready yeah. to cement, you know, drought over next season, but mm-hmm. I think this is a good hire. Yeah. No, the number four pick. I mean, they got they got some, you know, they got some some luck there and they got some good fortune there. They got the number four pick and what a lot of people thought was a three player draft. But now we're seeing it's kind of being extended a little bit with Jaden Ivey in there and a lot of people like Keegan Murray and Shaden Sharp. Where do you see the Kings going with that number four pick? Do Are they going to make the pick? Are they going to maybe try and shop that? Are they going to move up? What, what do you think they might do with that? pick? I think first of all, I think they should make. I'm, you know, I'm not sitting here saying they will because we all know they're like, you know, constant internal pressure to, to get back to the playoffs. You know, all that matters is next season's playoffs. But if you're the Kings, like make the pick like there's a chance you could get a star talent there where if you ship it away, you you know, you could probably get a role player uh, right. who would help and make you better next season. But that shouldn't be the priority right. uh, there. I, I don't know. I you know, I need to dig into the tape more. I've obviously been so occupied with this uh, playoff run, but mm. I like Jaden Ivey the most beyond those top three, but also like Jaden Ivey next to Fox. I mean, it's you're kind of re uh, introducing the problem you had a little bit with Halliburton. Obviously, Mitchell's still there. Like you, they need wings. They need big, long defenders who can shoot. Mm. When I remember there was like a ten minute period where they jumped up in the lottery, and you didn't know what it was going to be in the top four yet, and I was yeah. like. Barry Smith, you know, I thought like, right, you know, he's going to be a 40% three-point shooter who can defend a bunch of positions. Like, to me, that was the guy who could help now and be a potential, you know, building block for the future. But then they show up right away at four and you're like, eh, you know, that's that's kind of the spot of the draft. You want to be there. It's better than seven, eight, but you're yeah. like, or just, it feels like, you you know, you, you, you missed out on the last golden ticket potentially. Although, I don't know, what do you guys think? Keegan Murray, I, I, I feel like, if you want to thread the needle of win now, but also get a young guy in there, he, he to me seems probably most ready to help in a position they need. Mm. Go ahead, Bart. No, I was just going to say, I like all these guys. I like Ivy. Um, I like Keegan Murray. I've been a proponent from the start. And I've been a one man wolf pack, I guess, with this whole thing, just rolling the dice with Shaden Sharp. I love what I see from Shaden Sharp and what he could be. He's the type of guy that you just, you don't get like a, a guy, a three level score, a guy that, you know, possibly has the ability to defend. And yeah, I think about um, these playoffs and I'm not calling this guy this by any means, but I think about these playoffs who out of this group can go on the road in the playoffs and do what Jason Tatum did and hit the type of shots that he hit in game six against Milwaukee, right? Like fall away, turn around uh, from the inbounds pass, step back threes. Like, who of these guys can do that? And I'm not saying he can, but the skill set, it feels like Shaden Sharp is the one that po- possibly could be somebody that could do something like that in the future. Yeah, so the, – but this is kind of always the problem with the, the, the King's impatience where it's like to get the best version of Shaden Sharp, you're going to have to deal with like two pretty inefficient seasons probably, right? Bring him in shoot all the shots you want, shoot 38% from the field. Basically what Houston did this season with Jalen Green, Mm -hmm. it was like come in and like pretty much for the first two months, you might be the most destructive rotation player in the NBA, (laughs) but that's good. You know, we need, you need these minutes, you need these shots, you'll get better. He was better in the second half. Right. And, but the problem, you know, Mike, you're hiring Mike Brown and telling him you're committing to winning. You're you're making this a bonus trade and giving up Halliburton, which speeds up the timeline. You're probably telling Sabonis and Fox and Harrison Barnes if he comes back, like, you know, this is going to be veteran. We're going to really focus on trying to win early in the season. We don't want to play a 19-year-old if he's going to go out there and have four or five turnovers and, and shoot two of ten. Even if it's better for his development, it's bad for winning tonight. And that is the problem with this, like, you know, seesaw balance that they always, you know, the Thunder are doing it correctly. The Rockets are doing it correctly where you really lean into the rebuild or you really go for it and don't use the fourth overall pick. It's just, it's, it's just kind of what they always do. Right. So I don't know to me, Keegan Murray might be the in-between, but then where you're probably, where you're probably right is like if four years down the line, Shaden Sharp's a superstar and Keegan Murray's like a solid six man or something. You're like, Mm -hmm. should have taken Shaden Sharp, but do they have the patience to live with Shaden Sharp. Does ownership go, it's okay if you're 
five and 11 through 16 games next season, as long mm-hmm. as the young guys are looking good. I don't know that they have that patience. Yeah. Win now, develop now. We want to do it too. <laughs> got to spend a lot of money though. That, that's the one thing Joe Lake is doing. He's paying the the, the biggest uh, salary ever. Yeah. Well, it, it it is, but it, it's also be, like those aren't bad problems to have, especially like one of the guys he's going to have to fork over for is Jordan Poole. Like that's a guy that they they drafted. I think there's an article. I think it's in the Athletic today. I don't remember it's, it, where I read it, but it was a, about how this playoffs could influence this draft and the the you know. Guys, people are going to be looking for. They're going to be looking for guys like Jordan Poole, who might be able to contribute for you uh, in a different way that he can in year one than he can in year four. Mm-hmm. And like they're going to like Jordan Poole is now going to be this model for like, later draft picks. Uh, Rob Williams the same way. They're going to yeah. be looking for guys who who you know give them time, let them figure it out, and they're impactful pieces on in those two cases championship caliber teams. Yeah, I mean, and that's how it always works, right? Draymond Green bursts onto the scene, and then every draft, it's like, you know, who, who can find the next Draymond yeah. Green? And that's just – it's kind of how it works. But I just – I think they need a def- – like, I think Mike Brown's really going to try to build a defensive team because that's just who he is at his core. And and if you are giving him, you know, control of the culture of the organization, you know, I'm not saying he has personnel power, but he obviously is going to – like they need defenders. He needs defenders or else he's just going to be, you know, he doesn't have hair. I love Mike, but he doesn't, but he would be pulling his hair out. Right. You know, if, if, cause you know, Fox and Sabonis is a really intriguing offensive pairing, but it's just like, they've got to have good defenders around them. And at this point they don't, and there's no more valuable tool they have this summer than the fourth overall pick. So yeah. they got, I feel like they got to get a defender in there. Yeah. Real, real quick before, before I let you go, Anthony, um, just you touched on it a little bit. I just want to get your perspective on what do you think about this Fox Sabonis pairing? I'm I'm on the record. Once again, I find this a lot. I'm a one man wolf packer. Right? I'm, I'm on an island with my own. I think that's a good pairing. I don't think they're that far away with those two there. Um, but, you know, I, I could be off. A lot of people think they got a, They need a, a whole lot to get to say where a Minnesota is. But I, I like the pairing of Sabonis and Fox. What do you think about it? Yeah, it depends on what far away is. Like, you know, I can see them being a playing team next season, but it's like, you know, do you want to chase 8, 9, 10? Um, I think it has a chance to be efficient offensively. Um, they're both uh, – their, their pick and roll should be pretty deadly. Now, I do think the other three players on the floor need to be able to hit an open three because if not – it's crunched around and suddenly all these like, you know, tight window passes they're trying to make, they're going to be harder if defenders can just sag off because they're not worried that Justin Holiday, you know, Justin Holiday is going to shoot 32% or something from three. Right. Um, that just kind of screws with an offense. Um, but, you know, you go and look at the tape from last season. It's not only just Fox up top getting the screen and pass into Sabonis, but it's, you know, Fox backdoor cutting uh, while Sabonis has the ball at the, the elbow and some of his passing. And uh, I just – when they have an off season, have a training camp, uh, I, I do think it, it becomes potentially a difficult offense to prepare for, particularly in the regular season. You mm-hmm. see this with the Warriors when the passers are coming from unique positions like Draymond at the power forward, Sabonis at the center, when the point guard can maybe move off ball, also go on ball. Teams really in the, like because there's the, the schedule so packed in the regular season, if you have a unique offense with two lefties, by the way, I just think mm-hmm. there's a uniqueness to that. It's just hard to like come in. You've barely prepared because it's your third game in five nights, and it's just it's tough to guard them that night. So, I think they have a chance to be like a you know potentially in you know between the eighth and twelfth best offense or something like that next season. The big question, and it is the big Mike Brown question: Can he get them even reasonable defensively? Because mm-hmm. what was the stat? They haven't been like not bottom ten in defense since like Adelman in oh, 06 gosh. or something like yeah, that. Geez. That's insane. You can't win in the NBA if you just don't. Like just be an average defense. That's that's that to me is the biggest thing going into next season. Yeah. yeah. We asked for that last year and they managed <laughs> to be equally as bad as the year prior when they were historically bad. And here we talk about the dynamic offenses of the Golden State Warriors and the Boston Celtics. And oh, by the way, it's defense number one versus defense number two in the NBA finals beginning tomorrow. Anthony, we know you've been busy today, man. Thanks for carving out some time for us. We really appreciate it. All right, Thank fellas. You.